Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. K, the management professor, and this episode was made to promote April's Sexual Assault Awareness Month and October's Domestic Violence Awareness Month. In this episode, I interview two experts who share insight on what we can do to help others in these unfortunate situations. Thanks for watching. So ladies, I'm excited to have such expertise on the show. In an effort to promote Sexual Assault Awareness Month in April and Domestic Violence Month in October, I'd like to ask both of you a handful of questions so we can become more aware of these topics and hopefully how to prevent them. So let's jump right in. Tony, could you please share your background with us? Well, other than being an old lady now, there, there was a time when uh, in 1973, I joined the Pennsylvania State Police. And I was in the second class of women as a trooper. And I went through my training. I went out in the field. I was stationed in Lancaster. And uh, while there, I experienced several encounters with domestic violence victims and their families. Um, what helped me most prior to 1973, uh, as a young woman, I was married to a batterer. And that experience came with me to the field. And so when I encountered a victim of domestic violence, I took a little more time, a little more time beyond take the report, get it done, separate them, get the batter out of the house. That was how we dealt with it back then. So I took time to speak to them. And as a result, as time went on, I eventually ended up in our state police academy as a staff instructor and work with our criminal unit to, to, to improve our domestic training. And then I went out into community groups and began to provide programs for them before and after my retire. Well, thank you very much. Bree, could you introduce yourself as well? My name is Bree Burgess. I am the Victim Services Supervisor with the Reno Police Department. I started out my career as a therapist working with um, children and adolescents who were traumatized. Either they were assessed to be homicidal or suicidal. And then when I moved to Nevada about 12, 13 years ago, I started a career in victim advocacy. And I primarily work with victims of all crime, but in every single year, we've seen domestic violence is the incidence of crime is domestic violence affecting, uh, directly affecting victims. And so I have a lot of experience working with victims and I'm really passionate about what I do. And I also train the academy, we train on victims rights, our regional academy, which is comprised of multiple police departments and sheriff's offices. And then we train our individual police departments as well. That's great. Well, thank you both for what you do. Um, I'm gonna ask a series of questions. Tony, you can go first and then Bree to follow. So the first question is, what prompted, to, what prompted you to enter this field and support such a worthy cause? Well, I think the issue of my having been a victim and then a survivor of domestic violence, um, it was such a horrible, and to this day, I can close my eyes and still see images of what went on during that time in my life. So entering the police academy, entering the state police was just like a step forward to uh, become involved in law enforcement, to become involved in uh, involvement with all kinds of crimes, but obviously to maybe improve the response of uh, police officers to the victims of both sexual assault and domestic violence. Great. For me, I came to Nevada and I had my whole focus was being a therapist and really enjoyed being a therapist and really focused on helping people and helping people heal from trauma. And then I really learned about advocacy and how you're really in the front lines of crisis and the privilege you have of being in that trauma moment with someone and being able to help them heal and provide those coping skills was really impactful for me. And it's really kept me in this profession because I think the way that you respond to someone when they first are traumatized is so critically important to their healing process. And so that's why I transformed from doing the long-term care of therapy to really doing that direct service frontline response for as a victim advocate. That's wonderful. 
What are some of the tips that everyday citizens can do to help prevent such horrific scenarios? Um, to help, I'm sorry, my computer gave me a beep and I didn't, I missed oh, that the question. That's okay. What are some tips that everyday citizens can do to help prevent such horrific scenarios? Well, that's a monumental problem uh, to try and get to the community, get the information out, talk to community groups. Uh, I've even invited myself to groups uh, to talk about domestic violence, to talk about uh, you know, what happens to victims. And also the biggest thing I talk to them about is being non-judgmental because you're not gonna help the victim if you come at them from the judgmental perspective and trying to fix them, that'll never work. So uh, tips, kindness, receptiveness, listening, supportive um, responses to these people experiencing domestic violence, and also to be aware of the children of violence and to understand what's happening in the entire family, not just the obvious victim, but the, all, the children as well who are also victims. So providing resources in your communities, support groups, which are out there, but mostly just talking to people in your local groups about you know, what it means to be a victim and how to take some steps just to listen. And then obviously providing resources to help victims once they leave the battering situation. I really echo what Tony said about support system. I think that's one of the most critically important things for a survivor of any crime, but especially with domestic violence and sexual assault, is having that support system that's willing to listen, can go through all of those different emotions that the victim experiences, really validates their feelings and doesn't judge or question what they're going through or how they're feeling or what they, what they want, their choices. And so I really think that that empowering support system is what is needed to be able to prevent further victimization. I think the hard part with this question for me a little bit is sometimes what happens is victims take on so much blame and um, they take on so much guilt and blame from the, the victimization that they think there was some way to prevent it. And sometimes these crimes are not preventable. And I don't want victims to ever attribute their victimization to themselves or to any actions they've ever taken. And so that question is tricky for me because I don't want it to sound like, oh, if you did X, Y, and Z, you would never be a victim of domestic violence and sexual assault. It's more about having that awareness, that education, that support system that helps you even recognize when you're in a domestic violence relationship because domestic violence isn't about just physical assault. There's a whole power and control dynamic that happens that happens prior to typically any kind of physical altercation where law enforcement's involved. So I think it's really important to have that understanding of that awareness of what maybe feels wrong, like recognizing, does this feel like a healthy relationship? Does this feel uncomfortable to me? Am I questioning why this person's so possessive? Am I questioning why I felt like I was coerced into having sex with someone that felt more like a sexual assault, but I don't know how to label it and identify it. So I think that for me, it's, it's more about that awareness, that support system, that education, and just having more people understand what happens in domestic violence and sexual assault relationships and, and how that impacts the people that are directly impacted by the victimization, as well as their support system. I'd like to comment on that, if I may, Mary. Sure. Uh, you know, talking to victims about their, their experience, uh, a person who has never been a victim of violence always says something like, well, if he hit me once, I'd walk out the door. And, and that is so common because they don't understand the dynamic. And I think that's the critical part in dealing with victims. You may not understand it, but you can still be open, receptive, and supportive to someone in that situation and, and not uh, add the level of, well, I would walk out and leave because maybe they would have and maybe I would have. When I look back at my own situation, I have to say, why? I ask myself all the time, why didn't I leave? Why didn't I walk? I wasn't uh, uninformed. I wasn't uneducated. I, it happened because of some own emotional dynamics of my own 
marching right in to find someone who was more powerful, stronger than me, and, and took control of my life. Is there a proper way to respond to survivors of sexual assault or domestic violence? I think the proper way is just to be open um, and to be uh, receptive. Uh, body language plays such a critical part in, in talking to victims, you know, putting your arms up and crossed and, and, you know, those kinds of things most people don't understand or know, but just an open, uh, you know, uh, response um, not too many questions. I, at first, they need to talk if you can get them talking. And once you can get them talking, you need to get them to talk some more because over time they can begin to uncover their own issues and how this happened to them and, and how to take steps with professionals like Bree to move out of this with uh, guilt. Guilt is a big thing. You know, uh, I felt guilty. I felt guilty that I was hurting myself. I felt guilty that I was, uh, I felt sad for him. Um, you know, he was a mess, but I had to recognize that uh, I deserved respect. I deserved to be treated well, but I had to find that after some long discussions with somebody like Bree to understand that I didn't deserve it. And that's the one thing that you can express, uh, you know, to someone in that situation, you know, you don't deserve this. You need to reach out and encourage them to find help within the community, whether it's a, a, a professional uh, or whether it's a community group or support group and domestic violence programs uh, everywhere, uh, you know, are open and there's domestic violence hotlines to encourage them to reach out to. Great. I think one of the things as Tony was talking, I thought a lot about empowerment. I think again, when I was talking about sexual assault and domestic violence, a lot of that is about power and control and really empowering a survivor to recognize that they have choices. They have decisions that they can make. And especially when you're in a domestic violence relationship, often you have kind of forgotten how to be able to make your own decisions and you've so used to have someone else making those decisions for you. It's so easy for a provider to just jump into making those decisions for a victim as well. But it's so incredibly important to empower someone to make choices, to know that their victimization, understanding how that goes, that process from there. There's so much that, that helps a survivor recognize like that they get to decide where it goes from there. If once they've been victimized, they get to decide what steps they take next and no one else gets to tell them or dictate that for them. And I think that's incredibly important for survivors to understand that no one else should be dictating that. Even if they think, oh, this is what's best for you. Even if it's a family member who's always well-meaning and just wants you to be safe, recognizing that you have that decision, that's your life. It's your, you should be empowered to make those decisions and know have all the options available to you before you're forced into one. You, you have to be feel empowered to make those choices on your own. So for me, I think start with seeking to understand where the victim is, where the survivor is, is and how they're feeling about their victimization and then really empowering them to be able to make those choices along the way. So if you're a school teacher or a caregiver, what are some signs that children are living in a home where domestic violence occurs? And what can we do about the children living in a home where violence is a way of life? Well, one of the things that I have done with when I was doing training in law enforcement, first of all, is to part of my training involved discussing with the officers when they get to a home and there has been a domestic assault. After you have things under control, the victim is either uh, it's either they've been separated or we are looking for resources for her, we're giving her information. You need to talk to the children. You need to acknowledge their presence. You need to understand that they just witnessed a traumatic event and are themselves impacted by that traumatic event. And as children, they are not verbal all the time, young children, three, four, five, about what's happening. And no children want to be interviewed to say who did this and who did that. 
It's just to talk to them to see if they're okay in a soothing, comforting tone. And then from there, uh, you know, also find resources for the children. Uh, as far as the children's symptoms or, or what some behaviors, uh, I know in uh, younger children that have already been uh, bathroom trained, they start to wet the bed again. They, uh, they start to have nightmares. They cry and whimper in the night. Uh, they are too reliving that experience and don't even know that's what's happening to them. Uh, so very small children uh, watching their behaviors, temper tantrums, smashing toys. Uh, this, is, this is from little ones to preschool and elementary school, smashing things, hurting things. Um, I have seen children where in, in talking to, uh, watching a therapist talk to them, uh, she handed them a doll and the little boy picked up the doll and kept smashing it and saying, bad mommy, bad mommy. And he's already learning the behaviors associated with domestic violence. So aggression, uh, if a child is in school and their grades have been good, they'll start to fall. Their, their grades will start to crash. They'll start uh, isolating from other kids. Uh, nobody wants to talk about it. And maybe they have heard about what happens in that home and the child doesn't want to talk about it. So social isolation is, is something to watch for. Uh, temper, uh, you know, that, that same type of behavior toward females they deal with. I was giving a lecture at the uh, University of Scranton and I, I always share my story. And it is amazing to see how many of those young people without saying a word, let me know that they knew exactly what I was talking about. There were tears, there were looks, there were guys tightening up. And I had several of them come up and talk to me and said they never talked to anybody about it because they were embarrassed. They were embarrassed for themselves and they were embarrassed for their parents. So being a, a resource for them as well is so important. What can we do? We can acknowledge what's going on with them in the school setting. Uh, when we see uh, behaviors, uh, you know, getting them to the school counselor or school psychologist, whatever you have in the system, and helping them to get there, to understand that nobody's blaming them for anything. We just notice you haven't been yourself lately. We just notice that your grades are falling, and we want maybe to get you some help. So it's all about, I believe, uh, understanding and honesty, no matter who in that relationship you're dealing with. I, I think Tony answered this so completely that it's hard for me to say anything, but one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking was the importance of really teaching children what a healthy relationship is so they can identify that later. And then, because when children grow up only being exposed to an unhealthy relationship or an abusive relationship, that's what they expect to either have in their new relationship, whether they're the abuser or they're the victim. And so really maybe having schools be more, more involved in teaching what a healthy relationship is. I know a lot of things that they're doing are social skills training or teaching how to conflict resolution and negotiation skills. I think that those things really help a child, even in an abusive home, understand, oh, this isn't how it has to be. Like there's some ways that I can navigate this and maybe insulate themselves a little bit from the impact of the violence. Well, uh, uh, following a comment on uh, Bree uh, discussion, uh, you know, and there was a time when we did training, I did training with the Medical Society Alliance where they went into fifth, sixth and seventh grade to provide training on domestic violence and their hands are not for hitting program. And at the end of every training, we talked about, you know, what it's like to feel good about yourself. And we talked about developing healthy relationships, even in sixth and seventh graders. And it was amazing to me, even as a trooper, that at that point, there were sixth and seventh graders already involved in their own abusive relationships. And now even more so. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both for your time today, as well as your line of work. Our society needs it. Um, I'd like to end on an inspirational 
comment, if you will, could you each share something that you find inspirational about your line of work? I think when I think of inspirational, I think back to when I was on patrol in the early days of my career and I got a call to a domestic violence incident and the husband was gone when I got there. There was a woman there with three children and I don't want him arrested. I don't want him arrested. And, and I said, well, what do you want? And she said, I just want it to stop. And so we talked and I sat down and talked to her about domestic violence and about things she can do to reach out. And that was in the early days of the domestic violence programs in Pennsylvania before PCADV or as PCADV Pennsylvania, uh, you know, was developing. But about two years later, I came into the office up and got a card and the card was from her. And the card said, thank you. Thank you for taking time to talk to me. I need you to know I'm no longer in that relationship and I and my children are so grateful. And whenever I think I don't want to do this anymore, I think about that. That's great. Bree? I think of so many things that inspire me every day. I think just resiliency of victims that I interact with and, and I see their healing and I see the way that they leave these violent relationships and the way they heal from sexual assault and the traumas that they've experienced. I see the way that they transform it into helping others. I think that's incredibly inspirational. I, when I think about there's, as you were talking, actually, I thought about somebody because um, I was so surprised by this. She had told me she'd been in this domestic violence relationship. We, the police had been out several times. There have been multiple attempts to contact her. She was never really receptive to, uh, from our perspective, we didn't think she was receptive to resources. So law enforcement would go out and they leave what they're called blue cards. And it would just say, we were here. We were wanting to check on you. A crime report was filed. So I worked with her six years after that last, like after the first blue card was left. And I worked with her to leave this violent relationship. She reconciled with her children. She got a new job. She moved out of the shelter into transitional living. There were all these great things happening. And she said to me, I would really like to let the officer know who left the blue card that I saved every blue card that I've ever received because I knew one day I would find somebody who could help me get out of this relationship. I just knew it wasn't the time. And for me, that was very inspiring. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you both for your time. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, Bree. I appreciate so much your efforts on this subject. Me too. I'm excited to talk to anybody who wants to talk more about how to do better for our society and to help people work through the traumas that they're experiencing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.